life is rough. A little rougher when the walkers are after you. Join us as we watch through The Walking Dead once more. And bring you all the heartache. Easter eggs, hidden details, and survival tips that we can find. Related Geek now brings you... Sunday of the Dead. Warning, Sunday of the Dead contains spoilers for The Walking Dead franchise. Hey everybody. Hello. This is Marshall. And this is Lainey. And someday we'll get this intro right. This is Corey. There, there, there is no getting the intro right. It is just the intro. It is what it is. <laughs> At least we're still going clockwise, so that's yeah. good. Well, thank you for joining us today. We are doing the Walking Dead Rewatch Podcast Season 2, Episode 4, Cherokee Rose. And this is one that I've been waiting for for a little bit. I really think this episode is interesting. Yeah, this was probably a big turning point in the series, I feel like. Not necessarily for the actual plot, but for the fandom. I think this episode is what turned the fandom around to certain characters and made them fall in love with them. Where we're at now, as far as character goes, the in this episode, it's the crux of where the characters are at. Because the OG survivors that have been out there in the wild, they they face the truth. They know that w- they're starting to learn what they need to do to survive, and they are getting fairly good at it. Whereas what I'm calling the farm fam, they can defend their property as need be, because Maggie has proven that she can take out zombies on the horse. It's a previous episode, but they're still in denial about a lot of things, and that comes up later in the episode dealing with Herschel. And if I'm not mistaken, Lenny, you have some kind of fan swag that's a Cherokee Rose, don't you? Yes, I have a fan swag of this. It's almost like a locket keychain that I got from a loot crate that is a Cherokee Rose on it. And I think there's a quote on the inside uh, and I have it attached to a backpack that I have. But yes, so I am very much about the Cherokee Rose, uh, especially the lore behind it. And we're going to talk about that in today's episode. But first, let's talk about the episode itself, which aired on AMC in the United States on November 6, 2011. The episode was written by Evan Riley and directed by Billy Gearhart, and it garnered 6.29 million viewers. It became the highest rated cable program of the day, obtaining significantly higher ratings than Hell on Wheels. I don't know if you guys remember Hell on Wheels. Nope. Yeah, I do remember the Hell on Wheels. It was a Western thing that AMC was doing as well. Or The Real Housewives of Atlanta on Bravo. Principal photography for this episode commenced in Coweta County, Georgia, where filming locations were set up in an abandoned late 19th century Gothic Revival home in Sonoya, Georgia, and in downtown Sharpsburg, Georgia. So these are different places throughout the episode that they filmed. So let's start the episode. We are at the farm, and it looks like there is a group that is clearing away the rocks from underneath the trees. From what I can see, it's Glenn, Shane, Beth's boyfriend, Jimmy, Beth, and T-Dog. And as we see, Shane is wearing Otis's very large clothes, like super big overalls. It, it's kind of hilarious, actually. It really yeah. is. Shane just can't fill Otis's shoes. I, in our last episode, I, we talked about when Maggie gives Shane Otis's clothes, how it's going to fit. So this is an interesting way to look at that um, and remember, remind ourselves that that is exactly what he's wearing. He's He... Lonely looks schlubby because he has nothing to wear right now. So the group hears the sound of a motorcycle and they can see all the people from the highway coming back. We have Daryl on his motorcycle. We have a new car and we have the RV. Where is Carol's Jeep Cherokee? That was how Glenn and T-Dog got to the place. Okay, so it is there. Yes. All right. And so as, as we're going further, like they go back inside the farm and they reveal like Carl's fever is going down. He's he's out of the woods. He's going to get better. And his first words after waking from surgery is like, how's Sophia? Have you found Sophia? That's just, again, how much his heart is because he almost died. And his first thought is for somebody else. Mm-hmm. But then Rick kind of gives him these comforting words. And I think that comes back later on. Mm hmm. Outside in the yard, Dale asks about Carl and gives Rick a hug. He's really relieved about how Carl is. And Carol hugs Lori. That kind of shows how their whole family unit is still coming together and is still very supportive. 
Mm -hmm. And we get those rocks that were being dug up from the trees before. They've now been made into a grave mound for Otis, as uh, Herschel says his eulogy. Herschel says that a child is now more than ever our most precious asset, which is ironic considering Glory was going on about how a child shouldn't live in this world. And so when he says that, Lori kind of has this look on her face like, oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Shane is asked to speak about Otis's final moments here. And uh, it's just awkward. Yeah, it's awkward because he starts retelling the story that he kind of sort of told. But there's elements of it that don't perfectly line up. And I noticed Lori give him a look like, Wait, what was that? She catches that the story doesn't perfectly line up. Right, because I think the first time he says something like, Otis volunteered to stay behind or something. And then when he looked back, Otis had fallen and fallen to the zombies. And in this story, that's not what happens. Yeah, he tries to make Otis out to be an even bigger hero. Mm -hmm. Which is nice, but proves that you're making stuff up. Right. Dale kind of clocks it also, which is interesting to me because I this is the first time he's hearing this story. But when Shane is talking, he looks very confused. Like something doesn't make something, sense. Yeah, about something. This. Like, yeah. So he, I think he's a very good judge of what. Yeah. That is. Yeah. It also plays into the theory that we have that Shane is ex-military mm -hmm. because that's the kind of thing if you had to like talk to the parents of your buddy. Or at a funeral or something like that, you would want to gloss over all the stuff. Maybe right. it's classified. Maybe you can't say exactly what happened. But he's he has that ability to do that. After this scene, we return back to the RV camp. And Herschel is being briefed about Sophia and, you know, how long has she been missing, etc. And, of course, here comes Maggie with her survey of the county map. Like, okay, we're getting out of business. We're getting this done. It's got know? elevations. It's blah, 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 blah. It's just like, this is a detailed map. <laughs> <laughs> but a little quick survival tip, everybody. Google Maps and many other navigation apps have an offline mode where you can download all the maps for large areas into your phone and store them there. And navigation will run just fine especially since GPS is a completely separate system from the cell towers and is completely independent of power here on terrestrial Earth. So you can still use GPS navigation after the apocalypse, as long as you keep power to your phone. And this is one of many post-apocalyptic uses of a cell phone. Do not discard them. Mm -hmm. I have actually been very surprised to find out lately that... When I turn off my data and I'm using Wi-Fi only, but I'm driving in my car, it still works. It mm -hmm. still tells me things. And I'm like, that's amazing. Thank you, Google. And that can also help you in navigating to find places to scavenge, such as, well, where are all the local drugstores? And now you know where they are. Fantastic. What's near me? Mm -hmm. Then Rick really wants to get things started, but Herschel reveals that he gave three units of blood. Now... I would like to point out that I have received three units of blood at one point in my life. And before that happened, I was so weak. I, I was barely walking. Mm -hmm. I, I could barely walk. So the fact that Rick is walking around after giving three units of blood, I am surprised he's not laying on the ground right now, to be honest. But there's no way he's going to be out hiking in the woods. Yeah, he's definitely somebody who is... Uh, not quite superhuman, but getting on that lane. Correct. He's got plot armor. But Herschel also tells Shane he needs to not be walking because his ankle is very swollen. And Daryl says that he'll go by himself to the creek. At, but Shane then says, well, I'm going to go drive the highway. So what really breaks down is that Daryl goes off by himself. Shane, Andrea, and Carol end up going off to the highway to see if Sophia is still there and to look around and stuff. Right then, Shane turns to Rick and he's like, so I'm just going to bite the bullet here. What do we do if Sophia has been bit? What if we find that she's been infected? And while this discussion is going on, Maggie looks right at Herschel and he shakes his head. I totally missed that. That was great. Yeah. So they're like, um, should we tell them? No. Also, I want to bring up that this conversation is happening with Carol three yards away. 
Very subtle, Shane. You're really going to talk about shooting a daughter in her head? You jerk. Yeah. Then Shane says he wants to do gun training. They've been saying this for many episodes now. Uh, Herschel doesn't want the guns on the farm, which is ironic because Otis had a gun. Although not on the farm. Otis was shooting stuff outside the farm. So everyone decides they're going to turn their guns into, I don't know if it's Herschel or like a community pot. Shane says that he's securing them. He's securing them. They will set up a practice range off-site, and Dale gets to carry a rifle when he is a lookout. So he is the only one who has permission. I feel like the exception to the gun rule here is hunting rifles, Mm -hmm. which is a big distinction for somebody who lives on a farm. Like, there's a big difference between an assault rifle or a a self-defense pistol and a hunting rifle. They make the distinction. And that's what both of these two gun exceptions are. Maggie asks about what medical supplies that the group has, and Andrea says they don't have much, just kind of what you've seen that we have. And so Maggie volunteers to do a pharmacy run, and Rick says, hey, see that guy over there? He's our man. When it comes to in-town runs, you need to take Glenn. And (laughs) Maggie kind of has this look on her face like, what? Okay, sure. Why do I need somebody with me? (laughs) Exactly. Then Shane asks Lori if she meant it when she said to stay, and she said that she did. So Shane, his denial in this is that he thinks he's st- still somehow involved with Lori and with Carl, but the bl- the lines are blurry in his head because Rick is back, but he was really, I think, kind of hoping Rick wasn't ever going to come back mm-hmm. because he wanted this family that he maybe never had in his life, this closeness This ability to have a kid and protect it may be better than he was protected. Who knows? We don't really know that backstory. But that seems to be his thing. So earning love and deserving love, like it's like, I will do this, therefore I will be deserving of love. But Lori is basically shutting it down, saying, that's no longer your problem. Rick's here. We have our nuclear family. You know, you do you. You figure it out. But don't make this an issue. Maggie says to Glenn, I hear you're fast on your feet and know how to get in and out. So he's, he's looking at her like he's trying to figure out what this really means in the context of what they're talking about. Excuse me, ma'am. Were you using double entendre or were you speaking about something more urbane to our our needs <laughs> urbane uh, so Cliff, maggie then clarifies oh yeah we're going on a pharmacy run then maggie says that there are five wells on the land like she she knows now i know this is probably because you know her mother and her stepmother are both no, no longer around so she kind of has to be as the oldest child at this point the person who helps to run the farm so that's why she's the most knowledgeable So as far as the five wells, she does point out where two of them are. One of them is for the house, and the second one is close to the RV camp, but it's used by the cattle. And we're going to go approach that well a little later on in this episode. Then Maggie goes to saddle Glenn's horse, and it's very clear that he does not ride the horse. The horse is not his friend. Now, do you think that that's also the actor, or do you think it's purely the character? Oh, I think it could be both. Every actor lies and says they can ride a horse when they're going for a Western or something like that. But to be honest, even like riding a horse is not hard. What's hard is knowing how to act around the horse. The confidence level. If you if you're nervous, the horse is a sponge for your nervousness and they will freak out. And when you have something that strong and that big, you don't want that thing freaking out about it around you it's dangerous it's very dangerous so now we see that andrea is complaining about her right to carry the gun again so shane continues to teach her how to clean the gun which basic gun maintenance is actually a really good thing to know Mm -hmm. and so i just want to ask you if he just handed her back her gun last episode dale did and he is just now teaching her how to clean the gun What has she been doing with the gun she didn't have in all these previous episodes this season? Right. Like, we've seen her cleaning guns before, though. We've seen her cleaning guns. But she didn't know how to clean the guns yet because all he had said was, oh, it's really important to clean the guns. And then things happened. Now he's finally teaching her how to clean them. He just taught her how to disassemble it. But she was disassembling it when the herd went through the hallway. That's my point. How did she know how to do all these things? 
with a gun she couldn't even get in her hands because somebody else was holding onto it. Yeah, that's a very good question. <laughs> yeah, her headstrongness would make her steal the gun and try to do it anyway, but yeah, it's a good continuity question. Yeah. Rick asks Daryl if he is all right on his own. Of course he is. He's Daryl. Mm-hmm. He lives in the woods. Feral Daryl. <laughs> yes, but Rick also says that they have a base to organize, so Daryl doesn't have to do these things. I guess I'm assuming if he doesn't want to do these things. And he says that his other plans fell through. That's what Daryl says. And so I'm wondering if he means his other plans with his brother? What does I'm, he mean I'm, by that? I feel like this is kind of a snarky thing of saying, like, well, I don't have anything better to do. And he's saying that so that he doesn't sound like, I feel like I have to do this. Mm-hmm. I really need to do this for me. Yeah, because he can't be vulnerable in front of people. But also, this is a point where Rick is going, hey... You don't have to do this alone. You can trust other people. Here's a handout. Right. Which, as we see later, may have been a better idea if there was someone with him at this point. Yeah. Yes. Back to Rick. He tells Herschel that they can set up their RV camp closer to the barn to give them more space next to the farmhouse. And Herschel's like, no, 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 no. It's better to stay close to the house. Because, of course, it is. Because if they go closer to the barn... They'll be able to suss out the problem that is yeah. happening inside, right? Yeah, they'll they'll be able to smell that something's up. And then Hor- Herschel also says that this is a temporary situation. Once they find Sophia and Carl gets better, they're supposed to go. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Again, Herschel's like Herschel's in protection mode. It's like they're trying to like keep their little corner of the past, the farm fam. Like they're trying to like save the past in a way, just the safe little thing. We're in denial that. At any moment, a horde could come through and really change their world completely. So he's in, this is our little corner. This is um, all I know to do is, yes, I can be forced to help somebody, but I do not want them to change anything about the way this works. He's always, he's in, he's in no change mode, anti-change mode for sure. I think it's interesting the distinction between the two groups at this point and it gets tested as the episode goes on. Yes. He I think he's really he's afraid of being found out because his his mentality about what a walker is, I think is could be coming into question and he doesn't want to question that. Which is really interesting, I think later on when Herschel and Rick have a discussion about faith. And how Herschel almost wants Rick to consider things about faith. And I think we'll talk about that later there, too. Mm -hmm. But I feel like that's very ironic to me that he's just not willing to sway, but he wants other people to sway. Right, yeah. Maggie rides up with the horses and Glenn says, hello, farmer's daughter. This is almost like Animaniacs, Yakko and Wacko. Hello, nurse. (laughs) That is hilarious. But then, because Glenn is looking through some binoculars, Lori kind of steps in front of him and he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. (laughs) Don't mind me. I'm just, you know, stalking after the farmer's daughter. Anyway, so she gives him a list of items along with a personal item that he needs to be discreet about. And he says he really doesn't know what it is. And Lori says it's in the feminine hygiene section. How does he not know what this is? Because she probably has written it down by a brand name rather than saying pregnancy test. Yeah, yeah, because in case somebody found it. And he's a single guy that's pretty oblivious. I mean, let's face it, when we see future interactions with women, he's like, uh... Right. We approach the well, and T-Dog and Dale are filling up containers with well water. T-Dog apologizes for what he was saying when he was delirious, and Dale's like, I don't know. I don't know what you said. I don't. I don't know what you're talking about. No, you you didn't talk at all that day. It's almost like he's plugging his ears and going no 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 no. Exactly. And then T Dog asks if there if he thinks there is a snowball's chance that they will find Sophia. And Dale says, for once in his life, he's betting on a snowball. Mm -hmm. And then all I can picture is like those coconut cakes. (laughs) From, like, Hostess Snowballs? Instead of Twinkies? Instead of Twinkies, Mm. yes. T-Dog, I have to say here, is a really good guy. Uh, He keeps, he says things like he wants to find Sophia and do whatever he has to do to do it and believes everybody should do their part. 
And I feel like he's a really good community builder, a person who is not very selfish and just wants to make it all work. He's... To the point where I'm just sad that he doesn't really survive into the later seasons. He's kind of like a mortar where everybody else is bricks. Like, y you know that he's there. He's and reliable. you really miss him when he's gone. Yeah. But until he, he he's actually vital, you don't notice him there. Right. At that point, Dale looks in the well and then looks back at T-Dog. And T-Dog is about to drink some of the water. And Dale just knocks it from his hand no. and says, I wouldn't drink that if I were you. And then the look on T-Dog's face is like, oh, no. Oops. <laughs> Glenn, Lori, Maggie, Andrea, Shane, and then T-Dog had kind of gotten them. So he's bringing them all to the well. And they see that there is a bloated walker at the bottom of the well. And they think that it needs to come out whole and not either not totally dead or not ripped up more. So it doesn't contaminate the well water further. And at this point, I'm like, this is a lame excuse. It's already contaminated this well. Yeah, it, 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 that that skin's going to start coming off anyway. Metaphor alert. As I was watching this, I was thinking the present is the zombie. It's not just dangerous. It's corrupting. The well is that hope of life and sustenance the water brings to you. But the, the, the zombie is basically the turd in the, in the punch bowl. It's the, it's the reality. But it's this relates to the... People on the farm, the farm fam, they still believe that they can stay in one place, have wells, live a sustaining life. But the other crew has r realized that that's not really an option and they're going to realize it more and more as they go along. Mm. Kind of this episode is there's a lot of denial going on. And adaptability in this is really important. Yeah. Mm hmm. On the main part of the farm, Herschel is showing Rick a map and he says that you can see the creek from the point in the farm kind of overlooking a cliff. You can see the creek below. Herschel says it's good to stop and think, and that when he thinks, he stops and thinks. He thinks about God. But Rick says the last time he stopped and admired things, Carl got shot. So he doesn't think about that like that anymore. And at, I thought this is interesting because Herschel is really a man of faith, and Rick is really now a man of science and theory and what he can touch. This is also an interesting comparison of the fact that Herschel has a lot of faith. Maggie, when she was talking to Glenn on the porch, was talking about, I'm going to let you pray. I don't really believe that anymore. You just do what you have to do to make it right. She has kind of lost her faith. And it's kind of interesting that even in the same household, it's... It's like that. I think it's interesting because so the old saying goes, stop and smell the roses. But in this world, that kind of doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what Herschel's trying to say is just, just appreciate, stop to appreciate. But ultimately, if you stop for too long, it doesn't work. And I just now thought that's an interesting connection to the future of look at the flowers. <laughs> oh, <very good>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah at the same time though i feel like rick is not a man who's truly lost his faith he's struggling with it right yeah and he's trying to figure out where his faith actually belongs because i think at one point he he did have a faith it wasn't a very strong one it wasn't mm -hmm. one that affected his everyday life but he believed that there was something beyond reality and uh, now he's been betrayed by it Mm -hmm. But it's also the caring of people, too. Like, mm -hmm. he's trying to keep everybody together and keep it all together in his own brain and all that stuff. Herschel reminds Rick of his own injury when he got shot and asks if he didn't think God was responsible for his recovery. And then, after he recovered, the fact that he found Lori and Carl in, a, in the, the entire world. And then, after that, Carl survived his injuries. Couldn't all of these be signs that... That God exists, that God is still there for him to put his faith into. What do we think about this part of the conversation where he's talking about all these signs? Personally, I feel like there's just too many coincidences. Mm. That there is not just a feeling of God is looking out for him, but that all of these things are guiding him to an end. Him being shot was to preserve him for a purpose. And him finding Laurie and Carl 
was to keep him moving. Yeah. I like that there's no easy answers with this because just just full disclosure, we all were raised in Christian homes and yeah. with Christian movies and Christian TV and blah, 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 blah. And how a lot of times those go for easy answers. Where this is, it's actually, I'm always surprised when things that aren't quote unquote Christian media bring this stuff into it. But and don't necessarily just rip it apart to shreds. This one gives it a space to breathe and make you kind of like ask questions about it. At the well, they're trying to get the zombie to I don't know recognize that there is some ham on the it's end of bait. a rope. <laughs> yeah, they're using him as bait. They're noticing it. It doesn't give a rat's about it. And then T Dog says, "Well, because a canned ham doesn't kick when you scream when you try to eat it." And then whoever's holding the line actually bounces. The ham to try and make it quote unquote kick and scream. It's kind of funny. It would be and funny if somebody did a hog call while they did that too. <laughs> uh, Andrea says they need live bait, and then she looks at Glenn. And then at that point, Glenn mentions he likes Shane's haircut and he has a nice shaped head, which I was like, what? Please don't lower me down. You have a nice shaped head. Um, and then. They, when they start to lower Glenn down, Maggie is really not a fan of this idea. She's like, you're stupid. I think even now, though, she's trying to deny that she has feelings for Glenn. She has feelings for Glenn, even now. And also, it's a little bit funny how Maggie's accent changes over the seasons. Yeah, she's got an English accent, so her accent in the show is not hers. But she starts very southern, and she works her way out of that a lot. Yeah, no, I think the more time they spend in Alexandria, the more she loses that. I think she's very right. So as they're putting him into the well, the anchor pole breaks. So it's it's kind of like this big pipe that's out of the ground. So it breaks. Glenn goes further into the well, and they're pulling on the rope. Glenn's screaming. And at this point, I realized that Glenn's shirt sleeve, like on the cuff of it, says 23. Now, I know there's another number on the other side. It might be 13. I can't tell. But his sleeve does have a 23 on one side. So I was trying to figure out what that meant. I did a lot of deep diving and couldn't find it. But then we have Shane, who's number 22. So who's number one? And who does number two work for? So they think they're getting... Glenn, who's, you know, screaming and yelling, they finally pull him up out of the well. And they're like, man, that was just a waste of time. We failed. And Glenn says, says you, Mm -hmm. because he got the rope over the walker. When nobody, not even the camera, was looking. I tried to look at the time on Dale's watch. It was really hard to see. I don't know if you tried to verify my notes in here. I couldn't see it very well. So it either says 1030, 1010... 2.30 2.30 or 2.50. Right around there. Can't really tell. Because it, it, I could see three hands and one was like a second hand and one was a minute hand. So I couldn't really tell where it lay. It was, it literally looked like a flex capacitor. In the forest, we join Daryl as he's looking for Sophia and he finds the abandoned house. This is the gothic house in Sonoya, Georgia. That's where they filmed this. And so he's looking around in the house and it's mostly empty. There isn't a lot that you can see. There's some basic plates in the kitchen. There's an empty can of sardines on the table. There's a ton of spices. Yeah, all, like the... they're, they're huge body style <clears throat> plastic containers with shakers on them. Mm-hmm. And it's not just in the cupboard nearby, which is like three of them, but there's a ton in the pantry that we're going to see. Interesting. And then there is a small pantry in the kitchen area where it looks like someone has been sleeping in the bottom part. Definitely a small something because there is no way an adult could fit their legs in there unless all they did was sit up and it looks like it's a bed. So there has to be something small that was sleeping in there. So Daryl goes out the back door and you can see immediately there's a bunch of Cherokee roses in the backyard. They are very distinctive flowers. Although I never really knew what they were called before this whole thing, you can you can definitely tell a Cherokee rose now, right? Yeah. At the well, they pull the walker up and they get him halfway out, but he gets stuck. And so then they keep pulling and then the lower half falls back into the well. And now the water is contaminated. And one thing that I'm thinking is a little weird, they're pulling him up, not by his arms. No, the rope was around his neck. So somehow... His neck was stronger than 
the trunk of his body, which is oh. where he actually got separated. Yeah. How does that work? No idea. But I do have some cool things that I found out about this part of the episode. I watched a like special feature on the DVD about how they filmed the well. And the well is not only do they have it built as a hole in the ground that they can look down in it, but it's also built on a soundstage. Right. And it is 22 feet with doors on the side that they can open and look into it. And then there's a swimming pool on the bottom part. So they had the actor inside, who was inside the, the walker costume, in the swimming pool that they could look down on him through the doors. The costume itself was sculpted using a body and a head cast. The mask was previously utilized in the action horror film Grindhouse. So they, that's where they, got, they used it. The suit itself was composed of three layers, a thin skin-like substance that covers the exterior of the suit, followed by a layer of silicone and then a layer of foam in the costume center. Greg Nicotero inserted water balloons between the silicone and the foam layering, and he explained that as the performer begins to move, the liquid kind of transfers from one side of the costume to the other. Wow. <laughs> then the other thing that happened was they put squibs into the middle of the stomach part so that when they hit the squibs, it would cause the lower half to come apart from the top of his body and then uh -huh. fall into the well. The guy inside the suit, they needed to find someone who could understand how the suit worked and would be able to be in the suit for hours and hours and hours. So it actually is the lead mold maker on their team and his name is Brian Hilliard. So he is a you know, a special effects artist as well. So T-Dog just keeps running up and beats the crap out of the walker's head. Like, he's just... I'm done with this. <laughs> and Maggie's like, ugh. She just seems really disgusted by this. And Glenn kind of notices that Maggie looks disgusted by this. It's actually kind of a weird bonding moment. where, Like, because he looked away too, because he couldn't look at the gore. Mm -hmm. And then he sees that she turned away and he's like, huh. But I think he notices, but he doesn't know why she is doing this for real. He assumes it's because she's disgusted by the gore. But I think she's disgusted because of her view on what walkers really are yeah. in her mind. Right. T-Dog is miffed that they didn't just shoot it in the first place because... They had to go through all this trouble to get it out, and then it was kind of just the same. And now it's an even bigger mess. An even bigger mess. On the highway, Carol is near a car with the words, Sophia, stay here. We will come every day. On the hood, I tried to write down everything I could see that they left for her. There is an orange sports drink, a can of peach halves, two cans of vegetable beef soup, spam, peanut butter, three bottles of water, a blanket and something that looks like a jacket, kind of, and a flashlight. And then there's a box of something underneath the spam that I can't see. It might be crackers or taco shells. I don't know. That <laughs> just kind of find a box it looks like. Uh, I used to work at Universal in Orlando. And as part of the Halloween Horror Nights preparation, the attraction I worked at was going to have a Walking Dead house in it, and we got to work right next to that, a replica of this car with that message being on it. So that was pretty cool. When I first watched this a long time ago, the only thing that stuck with me was the peanut butter. Of course I, I, I Yeah, I love peanut butter. <laughs> I really miss it. But like, I, I knew that there was other stuff there, but I'm like, ooh, peanut butter. Huh. Yeah, she'll like that. <laughs> <laughs> Andrea and Shane are also there, and they keep feeling the need to say things to try to make Carol feel better. And maybe they should just be a physical support presence there instead of, like, telling her things that she knows are going to make mm -hmm. no difference. Carol's necklace is a cross, and I have to think that maybe her faith is being tested as well. This episode is a lot about faith. Yeah. Then they move on to find an area to practice their gun training. And as they're talking about things, Andrea says she is not in a patient frame of mind lately. Why is that? What is she so anxious for? I think it's more of she's recognizing that she's being now, 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 give me what I want. What? And not really being patient for other people doing what is emotionally good for them, doing what is right for them she's just wanting what she wants now there was a dynamic on the highway 
And now there's a new dynamic where new people and then that trust comes into that. And so she's trying to find her place, but she's also asserting it, trying to overly assert it just because she's probably been told by men many times, you you can't do this, you can't do that, whatever, who knows what her father treated her like. And then also the fact that her sister is now gone, you know, she's just kind of lashing out, but she's lashing out in very erratic and irrational ways that that don't take into account the whole group and the, her place in the group. One thing I want to note here is that uh, Shane is wearing a hat that says police on it. Almost like he needs a name tag to be like, hey man, I was a policeman, really? And he does also wear this hat in the comics. And then Rick wears a sheriff's hat, which also is an indication of his leadership, you know, persona. And it, it's kind of like while Rick wears his, I think because he just likes the hat, he's familiar with it. Shane wears his, I think because he's a pompous jerk who has to assert his authority over women and other people. <laughs> I thought it was kind of interesting that they both continue to wear those hats. Uh, when I look at these hats, I actually see a, a big stylistic difference. Because when you look at Rick's hat, it's much more of an older time of when the sheriff was coming into town and he kept everybody safe. That kind of a thing. Whereas Shane's hat is more of a modern police look, which, and this is not true of all police officers, but modern police officers have been starting to get a bad reputation for being much more protecting themselves and protecting their co-workers rather than trying to keep people safe yeah there's the, it's if you take about it it's the litigious nature that we're in now if you go back to the 60s fbi agents wore blazers and suits they did not wear shirts that have fbi on the back which is what you see now fbi atf whatever it is that has their agency in yellow really loudly on their person that has to announce so that there's no question of who they are. So that leads into what you were saying, Lanny. It's like asserting who he is by having that police hat on. But what I'm trying to get at here is that it's actually embodying their values. Shane's values is very much more of the modern police. Look out for you and your own first. Whereas Rick's is much more of an older style. Look out for the community. Right. Shane says that when you are reacting to shooting a gun to not think, just act. Yeah. And this, again, is kind of the modern police training. Think last, act first, because otherwise you and yours can be killed by an assailant. And one of the other things that I want to bring up is like as he's talking about this, he starts to get into this dark place in his head as he's going... This is what it's like to have to kill somebody and then realize later that it was the wrong kill. And the music is this tense, tense strings. And then all of a sudden, Andrea, I can't remember what it was she says, but she says something very, like, understanding to him. It's like, oh, I, I get that. Yeah, that must be really hard. And suddenly this very gentle acoustic guitar kind of comes in. So it's like the music is showing the feeling very well in this scene. Yeah, so Shane's baggage is like the wake of the people that he's killed. So without a center being the family, the nuclear family, which he thought he was going to have, finally have with Lori and Carl, he's untethered. So that's why we see Shane really reeling here. Like his new family is the ghosts. Of the people that he's killed. Oh, so yeah. We are now with Maggie and Glenn. And they are on the road. On their way to the pharmacy. And they're riding into town on their horses. Glenn says. He normally does this alone. Which we have seen him do. They pass Shrugs Hardware. And the Carriage Bar. So filming for this part of the episode. Occurred in downtown Sharpsburg, Georgia. The hardware store, Shrugs Hardware, and the Carriage Bar are at 108 Tarantine Road in Sharpsburg, Georgia. Originally, it is the old Sharpsburg Arctions building. 
and has also been the TNT Antiques and Auction building. Glenn assumes that Maggie is shocked about what happened with the walker, but I think she's thinking about the people in the barn. Mm -hmm. And who knows, she may have known this guy. We have no idea because he was, you know, around the farm. They're going to Steve's pharmacy and that also happens to be next door to the Old Horse gift shop. Steve's Pharmacy is at 99 Main Street. Now, producers converted an empty building into a temporary drugstore, and the guy who owned it at the time, Bridges, informed them that the space would be rented by a woman who would open a children's store there. However, she had not moved into the space yet. It does become Toodles Children's Boutique, but it is no longer that store. It has since closed. The sign in the window says, take what you need and God bless. And this really reminds me of those cardboard boxes in Fear, The Walking yeah. Dead, where it says, take what you need or leave what you don't on yeah. the boxes. And I was like, whoa, this is like way before that. Yeah. And it's it's something that I like to see in in these kinds of things. It's people just being nice. It's like, I don't need this anymore. I'm running off to find my own survival. But... Take whatever you need. Mm -hmm. So they look around and start grabbing things on the list. I do want to say there is a very nice walker with a, not a, not a zombie walker, but a, <laughs> a handicapped walker in the window. And I kind of looked at it and went, you know, that would be handy. Like if you are disabled in the apocalypse, which like, how, how do we not have disabled people in the apocalypse right now? This, this is kind of sad. I mean, we do in fear. He's in a wheelchair. Well, I mean, later on, we have somebody without a leg. And that, I'm sure, is is very common. So wouldn't this... I know they don't have room to take it on a horse. But later on, I think this would be kind of a handy thing for them to have, just in case. A walker among walkers. Exactly. I think it would be very wonderful. Exactly. So <laughs> Glenn finds the pregnancy test. And Maggie comes up and is like, what you got there? And he's like, uh, he shoves it in his backpack. And he just grabs whatever next thing is there to pretend like he has it. So the first thing I wanted to talk about is the pregnancy test itself. And the amount of expiration time on a pregnancy test, uh, is this pregnancy test still good? Yes. They have a shelf life of two to three years. So that's great. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but he doesn't realize what he has also picked up is a box of condoms. Are these still good? Yes. They have a shelf life of five years. So you can practice safe sex long after you can test to see if they failed. Also, I'm like, you know what, Glenn, you you need to have something else as a as a comeback if somebody's like, oh, you picking up condoms. So condoms do have some uses other than sex. You can light them on fire and they become really excellent kingdom. They just go up really it's, fast. That also makes me wonder about put, Daryl putting one on one of his arrows and just lighting it and shooting at people. It, exactly. <laughs> That's not a bad or idea. bolts. Let's get it right. They're bolts. And because it's supposed to be waterproof, you can use it to waterproof. You just wrap it around something, tie off the end. I actually saw a recipe for condom boiled meatloaf. Mm. I believe it's sous vide that. Yeah. Sous vide that. Uh, So there's plenty of uses for condoms that don't involve bumping ugly. It's too bad Glenn doesn't know any of them because Maggie. <laughs> Maggie's like, hey. so Maggie starts totally messing with him. You know, are you must be pretty confident. And he's like, oh no 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 no, that's not it. And he's, she's like, oh well, is there something wrong with me then? Oh no 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 no, that's it. No no no. <laughs> so, so, she's totally messing with him. Maggie says to him, oh yeah, I'll have sex with you. And he's like, wait what? And I think this kind of goes to show that Maggie you know, doesn't really have a lot of options in this. Honestly, I can say that the drugstore is probably a better location than the forest. If you're curious about this scene here, there's a really funny video where the two actors are on Conan and they go over how awkward the kiss was. And you could see Glenn having a total look of shock on his face. And he told Maggie that he closed his eyes. He didn't, his eyes weren't open when they kissed. But it, there's obviously cinematic proof that that was not true that he looked really awkward so she just kind of like strips down like he hasn't even said yes we're gonna do this she just starts to strip down and he's like oh okay this is fast i guess we're doing this then right so at the farm rick asks herschel to reconsider letting them stay and he uses otis as leverage kind of he says you know because of what otis did you know we have to be here so you should let us stay here at that point, it is revealed that Herschel's father beat him and caused him to leave home at age 15. 
He says some men do not earn the love of their sons. And that there are things he can't and won't discuss, but he will consider letting them stay. As long as they obey certain rules. Right. Rick goes to check on Carl at that point. And then we return back to the RV camp portion where Glenn is very happy and Maggie Maggie tells him not to spoil it. And it was a one-time thing. Yes, but for the rest of your life, it's still one time, you know. That's true. That That is true. So Glenn gives Lori the test. And there is a moment where Glenn has this look on his face about the fact that he is giving this to Lori... But yet earlier in the day, he and Maggie just had sex. So it's almost like he is considering the effectiveness of the condom. Am I going to have to get one of these pregnancy test things later on for Maggie? I don't know. (laughs) Should have grabbed multiples. Um... Daryl goes into the RV and sees that all the dishes are done. He sees they're all stacked up. I did notice another sign on the wall. I could finally see it. It says, nothing to buy, nothing to sell. We have gone fishing. You can go to... And then there's a blank, and it looks like someone has tried to fill in with, like, a Sharpie hell. <laughs> <laughs> Carol is doing some hand sewing by the lantern light, and at this point, Daryl gives Carol a Cherokee rose in a beer bottle. And he tells the story of the Cherokee rose. So I'm, I looked it all up, kind of a little bit more background of this whole story. So this also harkens to season six. Daryl finds another Cherokee rose when he himself was tired and lost. This rose was actually on a walker, and in that case, Daryl needed hope and strength to keep going while he was dealing with being kidnapped and trying to get back to Sasha and Abraham and back to Alexandria in season six. So it kind of is a dual parallel lesson here, but the background of the Cherokee rose was that in 1838, the Cherokee were moving west during the Trail of Tears. The mothers were crying because they were losing children and the elders called upon the Heaven Dweller as they were afraid the Cherokee Nation would die. So the Heaven Dweller spoke to them saying, to let you know how much I care, I will give you a sign. In the morning, tell the woman to look back along the trail. Where their tears have fallen, I will cause to grow a plant that will have seven leaves for the seven clans of the Cherokee. Amidst the plant will be a delicate white rose with five petals. In the center of the blossom will be a pile of gold to remind the Cherokee of the white man's greed for the gold found on the Cherokee homeland. This plant will be sturdy and strong with stickers on all the stems. It will defy anything which tries to destroy it. And then those blossoms grew along the trail as they traveled as a symbol of protection and courage. So that's a little little more in depth into the Cherokee Rose. I love the symbolism of the seven leaves, the five petals, the gold in the middle, and the thorns, how this flower is made up. I just thought that was really great symbolism. Of all the people who have tried to comfort Carol today, this seems to be the best method and the person to do it. Daryl is not the one I expected to be sensitive in this situation, but he gave her a bit of hope in this symbol. And he didn't try to, like, give her empty words. Yeah. And the other thing that he says here is, like, I don't have any illusions that these flowers are bloom for my brother, but they'll bloom for Sophia. And he, he's saying, yes, your daughter is worth all this effort and all this hope and all this searching. She's worth it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's the thing about Daryl that it shows in this situation is whenever they're suffering, you can go one of two ways. You can either get bitter and just kind of live your life for yourself. Or you can say, I don't want anybody else to go through what I went through. Mm. And that, to me, seems to be where Daryl's coming from this. Cherokee Rose poses the question, what will grow out of their suffering? Carl wakes up again, and Rick tries to confess Sophia is still missing. But Carl says that Lori beat him to it. So he just apologizes for lying in the first place. Carl notices Rick looks tired and compares their injuries. Like, look, I match. (laughs) I think your mother would rather we have the same eyes, so let's keep that between us. I love that quote. (laughs) I just, I think that's really great. (laughs) Then Rick passes off the hat to Carl since he's in the club. So this is where Carl starts to wear the sheriff's hat. And symbolically speaking, I have to say that Carl really tries to grow into that symbolic leader. Mm -hmm. that Rick is when he by wearing the hat 
Yeah, but he's also like I think this is also a point where we are starting to move more towards him as the emotional person that we're following because this is where we're starting to go into a dark space with Rick. Mm -hmm. We're about to hit something where we aren't wanting to hold on to him as who we're identifying. Right. Rick doesn't need the hat to remind people of his authority and respect or the badges. He doesn't need either one. Because true authority is not given because of position. It's earned through wisdom and authenticity. So he starts to put his badges away in like a chest of drawers and Lori comes in and notices that he is putting the badges in the drawers and asks, Oh, you're going to put these away. And he doesn't answer her about why. I think this is a really meaningful moment. Like it, th they spend a long time of him just putting them away before all the apocalypse. She accused him of not being there for him. And I am guessing that's because she felt he was too dedicated to his work to doing the right thing and now he's putting all that away and dedicating himself to the well-being of his family and also this is this is him wanting to put away the responsibility of leading the camp he's kind of like we're now in a safer space i don't need to be the one that's holding everything together anymore i can just focus on what's important yeah it's like the farm represents peace so the peacekeeper can put his uniform away Lori goes out to the RV camp and everyone is eating in the RV. I can see Dale, Carol, and Andrea. Probably Shane is in there as well. Because I can kind of see there's another person on the other side of Andrea or Carol. And I can't see who it is. So Lori takes the test out in a meadow on a log. I won't even get into how hard it is to pee on a stick without, without looking at the stick and also not getting pee on your clothes. That's very coordinated, Flory, at this moment, I think. Mm -hmm. If you look at a close-up of the stick, when they show you that there's a, the plus in the pregnancy bar, the brand name is, it looks like it's scraped off and touched up with white, so you don't see what the brand is. But they didn't do a very good job of it because you can see that they did that. Like, you can see it very plainly. Yeah, you could. We scratched this off. Who would want to be the official pregnancy test of the apocalypse? Oh, well, who would like to be the official car of the apocalypse? Hyundai. <laughs> so to end the episode, she is pregnant, but she is really not happy about it. Or she's very torn about either having the baby or understanding who the baby's father is or all of that mm. so as we're winding up this episode let's talk about what the title means so it is this one is probably the easiest one it's a cherokee rose is the name of the episode and the reference is to the flower that daryl brings carol and the hope of sophia being alive basically but it's also, if you look at that Cherokee Rose story, it is this faith in the presence of adversity as the, the elders prayed for you know, something to keep their people alive and they were given the Cherokee Rose. Here, they've been praying for something to keep them alive and they found the farm. This is kind of, can your faith survive the end? Yeah, because what were the mothers in the Trail of Tears story crying about? Moving on to the comic part of this, there are a couple things from the comics that uh, have to do with this episode. The first one is that Glenn reveals that he had his eye on Carol earlier on in the time and that Maggie offers to have sex with Glenn. That's page 225 in the comics. Rick wants Herschel to allow everyone to move into the house and Herschel says all this is temporary. That's a part of the comic. But also, Otis is still alive in the comics. Ooh. He does not go to FEMA with Shane and get caught. So he's still alive. Next week, we're going to talk about season two, episode five, Chupacabra. Chupacabra. Thank you for listening to Sunday of the Dead and exploring each episode with us. If you have any interesting facts or details about an upcoming episode, feel free to email us at share at elatedgeek.com. We want to bring you new and exciting geek-worthy content. If you want to help, please consider donating to our coffee account. The link is in the show notes and every donation is accepted with total appreciation for your support. Follow us on social media for more of our geek obsessions. Find Lainey on at Zany Laney or me at One True Hazard. For updates, keep an eye on Adelated Geek on Instagram or Adelated Geek Tweets on Twitter. Or go to our website at www.adelatedgeek.com. 
Links for these are in the show notes. Until next time. Geek out. <laughs>